Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for being with us. I'm Patty Ames, the Canon for Christian Formation and Staff Support Person for Becoming Beloved Community. I want to welcome you all as we continue our Lenten series and as we welcome our guest speaker this evening, the Reverend Marisa Safantes. Many of you knew Marisa when she served here in our diocese recently as the Associate Rector at St. John's in Roanoke where she also served the diocese as a missioner for Becoming Beloved Community. She now serves at St. James Episcopal Church in New York um, as an associate focusing on mission, parish life, and pastoral care. Marisa, it's a pleasure to welcome you back. We are glad that you're with us tonight and look forward to your presentation. Thanks so much, Patty, and welcome everyone. It's so good to be with you all this evening. Um, I, I, my only hope is that, my only wish is that it were in person as opposed to Zoom, but here we are four years later and Zoom makes things possible, like me sitting uh, in my office in Manhattan, uh, getting to talk to you folks wherever you are. So I'm thrilled for that. Um, and as Patty said, we're going to um, talk tonight, or as the slide says, about uh, the path from sacred ground to racial justice. Um, and this presentation itself is called what comes next? Um, this comes out of a talk that um, I originally gave last July at uh, the Episcopal Church's revival. It's all about love, um, which was a chance for the church as a whole to come together and connect around big topics that um, are important to us, like creation care and racial justice. Um, and so this presentation was designed kind of to help inspire those who are interested in racial reconciliation and racial justice, um, whether or not you've taken sacred ground. I know that it's in the title, but there are many ways to be involved in this work and to identify the barriers um, to continuing with it um, and push through them so that we might achieve God's beloved community. So I'm thrilled to be a part of the Lenten um, series. So here's my plan for the evening. I'm going to talk for a bit, um, probably more than I should. Um, and then I'm going to, um, and during that time, I will share uh, some of what it takes to keep us moving forward on this path. Um, and um, some of what's important um, if we're going to do this work well. And then if I haven't talked too long, we're going to talk to each other for a bit and share some of the learnings that we have, because I firmly believe that there is so much wisdom in the room itself um, that I want to take advantage of that. And then we'll come back um, at the end and hear a little about what uh, we've come up with collectively. Now, that's the plan. Things go sideways and change. And so if we need to, we will adjust. Um, but um, as um, although we're all used to Zoom by now, we do hope and ask for grace, um, especially since this is the first time in a while I've actually driven a meeting myself. But first, let's go ahead and open with a prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Loving God, you wonderfully made all things and all beings, and yet we, the perfectly imperfect, still have so much to learn and to do. Tonight, we come together seeking knowledge, seeking connection with those around us, and above all, seeking strength and courage for the steps of our journey ahead. So we ask you to meet us as we walk this road in your name. Amen. So as Patty told you a little bit about me, um, I used to serve um, in the Diocese of Southwestern Virginia at St. John's in Roanoke. And during my time in the diocese, I was also privileged to serve as the diocesan missioner for Becoming Beloved Community. And what that meant is that I got to work with churches all over the diocese and with the Becoming Beloved Community guiding team um, as we all did um, work to become just a little bit more of that beloved community that God wants us to be. Um, and then I moved to Manhattan and now I do other stuff, but I still try to keep centered uh, the work of racial justice of, um, and keep um, God's call for justice in the front and center of everything that I do. So really quickly, let me change my screen so I can see your faces for a moment. Um, I want to ask, um, just so I understand who's in the room, um, who has taken sacred ground? 
Um, just a quick show of hands if you've got your video on or you can tap the reaction button if you haven't. I see a lot of hands up, which is great. Um, that is good to know. And um, kudos to those of you who have taken it already. Um, you don't have to have taken it to, um, to listen to this. It is a fantastic program. I encourage you to take it when the diocese offers another round, hopefully in January, if the model has held. Um, and if you've taken it um, before they added the extra session that kind of serves as a capstone and sums things up, I hope you have the opportunity to do at least just that, sec that session 11 work. Um, because it helps move us from um, learning into action. Um, but you don't need to have taken sacred ground to listen to this. In fact, it's designed for all of us to um, help be mindful all, for all of the things in the pathway because the work of racial justice can't rely on just one thing or a handful of things. Uh, and I also wonder, because in my experience, many times in congregations, we get to a point where sacred ground kind of reaches a saturation point, where you may have a bunch of people in your congregation, but only a handful who have taken it, because it's a really long program. And so you want to find ways, as somebody who's taken sacred ground or someone who's interested in this work, to still engage those um, who may not have time to um, commit to take sacred ground. So... Um, in that context, I think sacred ground becomes one tool in our tool bag. It's one that's critical for opening our eyes, um, for providing the opportunity to recenter histories that have been forgotten and swept aside. Um, but again, this work requires us to use many tools to move the mountains of injustice and oppression. So um, let's go ahead and jump in. I tend to talk a little quickly. I apologize for that. Um, but I will ask if you can hold questions and comments until later, um, but you can drop them into the chat and Patty will be monitoring that chat and um, we'll keep track of things. So when we get to a point for questions um, that um, you, um, your question is still captured. So uh, without further ado, let's see if it'll do. There we go. So the first point that I want to bring up is that the path to racial justice is collective work. I'm sure this is not a surprise to any of you, um, but um, we all have our own journeys um, and, and, and our ability to move forward is absolutely tied to everyone around us, hopefully those who are walking with us, but also those who aren't. Um, we all come at this differently with our own hopes and ideas and challenges. Um, and fortunately, I think um, someone far smarter than me has come up with a way to put this in a graphic. You've probably seen this already since you're in Dio Suava, And this is one of the ways that we talk about the work of racial justice. Um, and it's this chart right here, this kind of spectrum. Um, and I think this is helpful for those who haven't seen it because it really brings to life um, how there are so many different ways to approach um, these issues um, that we sit at different spots of the spectrum. So those of you here tonight may be active allies or passive allies even, where you are interested in how to hone your skills, how to learn more, how to be empowered in this work. Um, and you may be um, engaged with people who are oblivious neutrals, who know that something's going on, but don't really know what needs to be done. And so you need to find ways to inform those around you. Um, and of course, we also have opponents who um, are still trying to figure out why this is an issue, why we talk about this, people who have actual needs and fears around this that we want to try to address. address. So this entire spectrum um, exists um, for uh, as we look at um, the work that we need to do to move forward towards God's beloved community. And the interesting thing is if you pick an ism, there you may be on one part with regard to racial justice and another part with regard to another ism. Um, and so we all fit in different spots in this chart based on what the issue is. We all have work to do. 
So it's important to remember um, as we do this work to that um, to ensure that you are creating opportunities for people to intersect with this work, um, no matter no matter where they are, where they sit. Um, that if you're only preaching to the choir over on the um, on the active side, on the ally side, then you're missing the opportunity to help move the needle um, for those who are on the opponent side. Realistically, it's a challenge to do because these are different programs with different emphases, um, but it's work that is very worthwhile for us to think about what programs we offer, um, what opportunities we offer, and how to try to bring in um, as many people as we can. That doesn't mean the same program works for everybody, but that we want to offer a range of opportunities for people to engage in this work. And in Diasuava, we've talked about this as having multiple on-ramps, kind of the idea of a highway doesn't just have one way to get on, but that there are different ways at different points in the journey for people to join. Um, if you um, have just, you know, programs that are focused just for one set of people, you're not, you're either not giving others a chance to flourish or others a chance to grow. And so when we look at the work that we do, um, we want to try to offer a range um, there. And, you know, what does this look like practically? That's the example that I like to use is that, um, you're not gonna ask a kindergartner to read War and Peace. I don't know if I'm gonna read War and Peace actually, but um, right, you, you want to find what is appropriate for an issue for people to be able to engage. Because if you give them too much right away, they're not gonna be able to digest it. They're not gonna be able to understand um, how to integrate it with where they are currently. Um, and so you want to look at how am I moving the needle on the left? How am I moving the needle on the right? How am I keeping those who are active in this work engaged and growing? And how do I bring along those who still have a lot of doubts? Um, so that is um, one of the ways that we can um, try to um, continue to, to grow our capacity um, and um, how we can shake off the dust bunnies, how we can um, get people moving in the direction of the gospel work. Um, so what does this look like? Um, what are some ways that we can do this? Well, um, for the people on the left side, the allies, maybe you host a book study on liberation theology. Um, that's something um, that, you know, that we've done. Um, uh, or, you know, maybe for somebody on the right hand side, instead of, you know, really digging in like that, because maybe they're not ready. Maybe you talk about what the disparities are in the healthcare system, different outcomes for people of color, something that's very data-driven, something that is educational, but allows somebody to dip into the issue and understand just a small part of it, right? So that if this group is reading CAST, this group is, is finding a way to engage in one piece of something um, in a way that um, helps to bring them along. Um, and, you know, you never know what may happen um, as you continue to, to do this work and offer different types of opportunities. Who chooses to engage? Um, yeah. And so number nine uh, is the path to racial justice is sustained. Um, has anyone ever been to Niagara Falls? Show of hands really quickly if you've been to Niagara Falls. I see a couple there. Okay. I grew up not far from Niagara Falls. I grew up in Buffalo, New York. Um, and one of the things that's always been super, super interesting to me about Niagara Falls is that the falls didn't start out where it is today. The falls started actually way, way, way um, downstream of where it is. And over time, the force of the water going over the rocks has eroded the Niagara Gorge to where the falls is today. And that process even continues um, over time. The rocks fall in, they have to clear them out because the falls is still growing. If you think about something like Niagara Falls, as big as it is, and the rocks as hard as they are, um, 
growing. Um, you can see over time how things can change, um, even in, in glacial um, in glacial time. Um, or you can look at how just a plain rock and water dripping on that rock will slowly um, change the rock, carve it out. Um, so that's kind of what the path to racial justice looks like. It's something that we have to pick up and continue. Just continue those drips, those drips, because over time you're changing. Um, you are changing and the people who you're reaching are changing and they may not even know it, um, but slowly over time, um, the work that is done helps to produce results uh, that you don't even realize in the beginning. You know, we like to say um, that um, the opposite of love isn't hate, but the opposite of love is indifference. And, you know, you can't fix this all at once, um, but by continuing to chip away, by continuing to drip um, slowly over time, you can do amazing things, amazing things. All right. Number eight, the path to racial justice is multifaceted. In the Episcopal Church, we love to read a book. This is one of my favorite things to say. Um, you know, and even people on the left side of the spectrum um, that consider themselves allies, you get caught in this do loop of wanting to know everything and you forget that we actually are called to do, to be the hands and feet. You know, we will read a book and ha host an education, pat ourselves on the back because we've done something. And the reality is, is that there's so, so much more that we can do. Um, there are at least five different types of social justice work that we should be mindful of. And um, ideally, when we're doing work of brainstorming and planning and figuring out how do we engage in this work, it's helpful to know about these five and to benchmark the work that we're doing so that we can say, yes, that's right. We're not just, let's do the education. Absolutely, it's important, but it's not all that we should do. Um, and so here is a picture of the continuum of um, social justice activities. Um, and it's a continuum because um, things move. On the left-hand side with direct service, um, you're accepting existing power relationships all the way across to direct action, which challenges existing power relationships. And if you're in Dia Suava, you've seen this before too, I hope, because we talk about uh, this um, as part of our work. Direct service, that is charity and volunteer work that we do. Self-help involves supporting marginalized people as they help themselves. I think of the um, program um, Out of Grace, where you've got uh, the congregation walking with those who are um, out of, uh, were formerly incarcerated. Um, that's such a great program um, that actually helps people um, where they are, and, and, and it's us walking alongside them. Um, and then you've got education, um, where we teach others, um, we learn ourselves. Advocacy, um, that's where we start speaking on behalf of people, uh, on behalf of the marginalized. We start raising our voices in school board meetings and in at city council. Um, we're actually getting together in, in real ways to amplify the voices of the marginalized. And then direct action, um, that's where we're protesting and marching and boycotting. Um, the Episcopal Action Network um, is an arm of the um, Episcopal Church that has a great email list, for example, um, that provides opportunities for advocacy. Um, when, um, you know, call your representatives or be aware that this is happening um, so that you can help uh, give voice to it. Um, so there are a number of different ways to engage uh, and, and be engaged. And this list helps us take a look at the programs that we as a congregation, we as a diocese um, offer. And um, if we're not engaged in all five of them, the question is, can we be? Is there a reason to not be? Um, so I think this is a helpful tool as we think about 
And again, you have to overlay this with the compass and think about what those activities are. Um, so it's a, a multi-pronged um, um, opportunity to be able to engage those in different ways. All right. Um, <sighs> Does this need to be said? The path to racial justice is uncomfortable. I, I hope we can be on about, honest about this, and I because I think it's important to be honest about. Um, inertia is a powerful thing, um, and I think that that's sometimes where we find ourselves. Um, if you think about it, here we are nearly four years from George Floyd's death, um, and that moment in 2020 where the country kind of found itself um, in a national conversation on racial justice. Um, everybody was shocked and appalled at the treatment of Mr. Floyd. Um, and I remember the shared outrage, the fact the people who took to the street, bishops gathering to, you know, um, talk and walk and pray on behalf of racial justice with the, with those around them. And I was hopeful because it really seemed like we as a country were waking up to where we have been and we were open to truth telling about where we really are. Um, I bet you probably were too. And so it raises this question where we sit now in March of 2024 and our conversations around banning books in school that make plain our shared history and equality and inclusion have become hot button words all of a sudden. It feels like we're losing ground um, and Still, even with that, the work remains. The work of racial justice demands that we have difficult conversations and that we make difficult choices. And this is the work that we are called to as Christians. Um, it is critical for us to be able to cultivate um, the skills then that, um, that help us have hard conversations. Um, and not just around racial justice, but any areas of justice, um, because we live in this fractious world. So for us to be able to stay in community, foster community, we have to have ways to talk across difference. You can do this in many ways. I'll give you one example. Um, St. John's in Roanoke in 2022 had a Lenten series called Let's Talk About. Uh, this comes um, from the format for Living Room Conversations. It's a website. Um, and um, these conversations were specifically designed to learn to talk to each other um, on areas where we didn't necessarily all agree. Um, each week, we took a different topic to focus on. Um, and you didn't have to come to all six of them. You could pick and choose which one you came to. Um, some weeks were more heated than others, but we got through each of these and we learned about each other and we learned to have conversations on issues that when we tend to try to stay polite, we don't always talk about in church. Um, and by the end, the, the, the focus wasn't to change minds. The focus was on developing our listening skills, to exercise that skill of listening to each other, even when you don't agree, even when you want to be like, but but sitting and listening and being present. And so um, that was a skill that the congregation, those who were involved in those, um, um, have taken into others, uh, into other um, areas, and also that they can take those that, that skill set um, into other areas of their life, um, not just around issues of social justice and racial justice, but it works really well for those that you can have conversations with people who disagree with you and, and find ways to um, be present with each other in a way that, that is meaningful and, and goes deep to the heart of things. All right. The path to racial justice is found outside our walls. In fact, I would say that it must lead outside our walls and into new relationships. Um, and, and so this gets us asking kind of what have we done and what are we willing to do? Um, this is an area where you can think differently. You can look at um, your space, your kitchen, 
um, and how it gets used, if only it gets used on a Sunday, or the rooms that you use for Sunday school that sit dormant, perhaps. Um, churches have space um, that the community can use and be welcomed into, um, that bringing those from outside in, um, finding different ways that we can engage with others who um, we may not see on a Sunday. Um, it's easy to rely on what's comfortable, but if we find ways to build sustained relationships, um, then this work becomes not just a flash in the pan, but something that is sustained. Um, but then there are also some not what not to do's as we find ways to um, be engaged in our community. Here, I think about um, uh, the work that um, the church in Abingdon has done for many years and working with the community um, and having programming on Martin Luther King Day. What a wonderful way to, um, and not just once, but every year, um, the community comes together ecumenically and, and produces Martin Luther King Day um, content. Um, that's wonderful. Um, so, you, But you need to think carefully because sometimes we get an idea and we want to burst out we, we get so excited um, that we want to um, fix things, right? Because we found this idea and it's going to be great. But it's very important that we um, listen to those around us. So if you have a kitchen and you can think about ways to use it, go talk to people. Go talk to who you think may be interested in something that you've got and listen to them and find out how you might be of service. Because the thing that you think may be the fix may not be the fix that they need. Um, and, and so we wanna try to figure out ways that um, we aren't rushing to fill the gap, but that we're allowing people to identify for themselves what may be most helpful. One of the ways that we find this community outside our walls is to find is to broaden our circles deliberately broaden our circles um, so this could be interfaith or ecumenical work but this is probably getting involved in different parts of your community that your congregation may not be currently or a few in your community in, in your congregation are but finding a way to broaden those who are involved in that way um, like we like to say you can't keep preaching to the choir you got to send the choir out so um, how, where are the, where are the needs in your community and how can you listen, um, to what they need so that the remedy that you craft, um, is, is helpful, not just because you think it's helpful, but because they say it's helpful. And also, but the work is also found inside our walls also, because it is found in our stained glass windows and the art that we hang on our walls and in our liturgy. Um, it's important to be mindful of those pieces too as we look at what the path to racial justice looks like because if um, someone walks into your space and can't see um, that you see the image of God in them, are you really inviting them in? Is that really the welcome that you wanna provide? I think, again, Grace and Lexington can say a lot about that and the work that they've done in that regard. And it's also something that we need to work on individually, too, and can work on individually. One of the things that I always encourage people um, when I talk about this is to deliberately diversify your social media feed. Um, if you're not on social media, good for you. Fantastic. Uh, but those of our, who are, um, you know, figure out who are voices that you're not seeing in your feeds and start following some of those people. Um, you know, I can think for myself, um, for example, um, I have started following a woman named Miriam, who's an Orthodox Jew, and um, she gives a peek inside her life to people who aren't um, Orthodox Jews so that we can learn more about um, our commonality and how um, how uh, she lives, how her family lives. Um, and um, Cole Arthur Riley um, has a, a, 
um, not only she's written books um, at this point, published um, Black Liturgies, but she also has a social media presence that um, shares um, a lot of uh, racial justice related uh, materials, things to help um, get you thinking, in part because they're not focused at you. Black Liturgies is focused at people of color. Um, but for you to see what the conversation is, um, what the comments are, um, will help you um, think about Notorious Cree um, on Instagram, who shares um, his experience as a Native American, primarily through dance. Um, and so there are find ways to blow open your social media feed so that you're not just listening to an echo chamber, but that you're surrounding yourself with different voices. Um, that's an important part of my practice and, and I, I commend it to you as one that could be yours. The path to racial justice is not all about racial justice. I know this sounds controversial perhaps, but stick with me. And this is the idea that we are all in this together, that our liberation and our salvation are tied together. I know that there are other opinions on this, on how we center things, um, because it's easy for one issue to get lost um, as we talk about different things. It's easy to get overwhelmed as we think about the full slate of issues that um, that um, we could talk about, that we could uh, engage in. Um, there's a lot of work to do. Um, and so what I think this means is that we should create our team or find our team, create our plan, know our audience, um, and look for ways to build success. Uh, we might have success in one area, um, but then let's keep chipping away um, at the other. Um, we are, our, our liberation is tied together. And so, and there are a lot of isms. So we want to find ways to, to um, engage um, in ways that are meaningful with as many as we can. Number four, the path to racial justice is emotional work. Instinctively, we know this, but I think it still creeps up on us in different ways. And I think it's important that we have to remember that this is a marathon and not a sprint. Um, as the saying goes, we have to remember that the goal won't be accomplished in our lifetimes and maybe not in our children's lifetimes. But that doesn't mean that we don't have to do this work. Um, but the reality is, is that it's hard and it can be disheartening. Um, and um, so in order for this work to be sustained for us, um, we have to approach this as a lifelong journey. We know that we're called to this as Christians, but in order for us to do this in a sustained way, we've got to gird ourselves for this work in a way that is meaningful. Um, and so how are we mindful about when and how we do this work? Um, how do we care for ourselves as we do this work? Um, that's an important piece that, that gets forgotten all too often. Um, that may mean that we continue to grow our skills, that we take sacred ground again, that we look for other opportunities, that we attend the um, beloved community track at annual convention, diocesan convention, to be able to learn more about what others are doing in this regard. It may mean taking a, a being uh, participating in a Lenten series like this one. Um, and it's being mindful of those spaces that we can surround ourselves um, with those who are in the same quadrant of us, because it takes work to push, to continue to push um, the, the um, spectrum. Um, sometimes it means pulling back from the work because you need to care for yourself and allow your batteries to recharge um, because burnout is real. Um, and regardless of what has caused the burnout, um, you need to address it. And so how do we find ways to um, recharge our batteries so that we can return to the work renewed? Um, and I think for those who lead this work, I think it's also important to remember to um, keep an eye on your people. Um, because while you're checking in about where you are. Um, if you have a team around you, it's good to check in with where they are too. Um, because 
much like marathon runners, you know, how you see people and they're running, 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 and they get to that last mile and they fall down because they've used up all their gas. That's what we don't want to have. We want people to not be falling down and not be able to get back up. So we want to find ways that the people who are doing this work um, recharge. And so if you're in charge of it, if you're in it, check on the people who are around you and help them um, develop healthy practices so that they can engage in this work in a sustainable way. Um, Hmm. I'll tell you a story. Um, my thesis um, when I was in seminary looked at the emotional labor that African-American clergy um, spent um, primarily in the summer of 2020 after the death of George Floyd and had a lot of rich conversations about what their self-care regimens looked like um, during that time. But one story stood out to me, and that was of an African-American rector at a predominantly white church. And she explained that when things got really bad in the country, um, she recognized that she um, needed to care for herself and for her family so that later she would be able to care for her congregation. Um, and she told her congregation that, I need to step away. I can't be your pastor for this because the work is too deeply rooted in for me. Um, and that's that idea of concentric circles and, you know, caring in, not out. Um, and it's also that idea of when you put on oxygen, oxygen masks in the, on the airplane, when you get on and the stewardess tells you, put on your own mask first before you help somebody else. Um, and so that's, it's really a reminder for you to be able to check in with where you are and with those around you um, so that we can all stay fueled up uh, for the long run. And my pro tip for this is when you're meeting with others um, on difficult things, it really helps to have good snacks. Um, let's see. And then uh, let's, you know this, uh, the path to racial justice must be truthful. Um, and and I hope you've seen this too. This is um, the labyrinth that the Episcopal Church uses uh, as an illustration for its racial reconciliation work. Um, and so you see the four quadrants that are there. Um, we've been talking all about them um, today as we go through the different um, um, points, um, but um, we are called to tell the truth about uh, who we are and where uh, we've been. Um, I think this is particularly um, relevant for the Diocese of Southwestern Virginia um, and how it came to be the diocese that it is today. Um, you can learn about this story as you do the racial justice stations of the cross. I think, Patty, is that next week that you're doing that? Yeah, I mean, so what a perfect way to learn more about the stories that exist in the diocese um, and tell the truth about who, who um, we are, where we've been, and, and where we're headed. Um, this is, it's easy for us to have, it's important to tell our stories, um, <clears throat> because there's this type of cultural amnesia that tends to soak in the further we get from something, um, and it starts making the sharp edges fuzzy, um, or removes them entirely, um, and so, um, Telling the truth um, makes clear, uh, pulls back the layers, um, and reminds us of, of us of who we are, where we've been, and and where we're going. So telling the truth is is critical. The other reason I show this um, the labyrinth here is because it's important to remember um, that um, how nonlinear this work is. It wraps around and back and forth and through uh, the different areas. And it's, it's such a good reminder of, of the fact that um, this way isn't straight, um, but yet we continue to need to continue to push forward on this path. 
Okay, here's the last one for now. And that is that the path to racial justice seeks to repair. Because you can't have reconciliation without repair. I know the word, you know, that some use for this is reparations, repair, reparations. And I know it's a loaded word. Um, and that if you immediately say this, then you've got people who are going to shut down and just stop listening to what you have to say. But that doesn't mean that that has to be the case, because, again, the root is repairing relationship. That's what um, reparations is designed to do. And it's also where some of the most careful work has to happen. Um, repair happens in all kinds of ways. Um, there, you should not have to just turn away from in order to, to seek repair. So, um, Patty, I'd like to, we've got, I was going to break out into groups here, but we've got a small enough team that maybe we open it up for conversation a little bit. Um, and um, because what I'm hoping is that we can talk about um, where you find the sticking points in your own personal work in that of your community um, so that we can talk about that a little bit and we can probably I don't know if we want to stop the recording for this part and then come back so people feel that they can share uh, my um, last slide and we will um, and then we can talk some more if we need to where did we go all right, can you see that again? Oh, nope, not yet. There we go. Here it comes. Okay. All right, last one. I can get it to change. Our path to racial justice. This is the most important one, right? Is our gospel work. Um, and we we tend to to um, not talk about this. Um, we talk about all the other things or realize them, but um, this is what we are called to do. Um, it, it is embedded in who we are, who we say we are as Christians. Um, and so that is why we keep talking about it. This is why we keep trying to find ways to engage in it. Um, I think of the words of Cornel West here, that justice is what love looks like in public. And we are all called to be people who share God's love with the world. Um, our baptismal covenant reminds us of this um, uh, as we um, think through all of these questions. And as we will say, um, when we come together um, for Easter service in just a few short weeks, somehow, uh, the fact that we're here at Easter already. But this is how we seek and serve um, God and all persons, loving our neighbors, ourselves, and how we strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being. And it's also we, how we proclaim by word and example the good new to, news of God in Christ um, and how we persevere. Um, it, it is all of these questions. Um, this is the work that we are called to do. Um, we're super good at answering our answer to question number one. And so the question becomes, how do we do the rest of it? How do we integrate um, this work of racial justice into um, our lives, how we live out our faith? Um, this is this is our work. This is what we are called to do um, and who we say that we are. Um, and so my hope is, is that um, through listening to this and, and through the work that the guiding team is doing, that you sweep out your dust bunnies and find ways to um, build multiple on-ramps um, so that we can engage with people, even those who may not know how to drive a car yet, um, and uh, that we find ways to keep dripping, dripping in the water, because over time we know that um, we can eat away at the rocks. And may God be with us on the journey. Thank you so much, friends. It's been a pleasure. Um, if you have other questions or want to chat some more, I am happy to. But that's what I've got for you tonight. Thank you so much, Marisa. This was so helpful to, to go through those steps with you and, and um, hear those details. I truly appreciate that. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask Marisa or to put in the chat? Um, and if you haven't looked at the chat, I put a couple of things in there that Marisa spoke of. I will also send a follow-up email tomorrow 
to everyone with a couple of those resources and things that she mentioned. Any questions, comments? Well, I have a question, Marisa. Yes. Um, so with regard to uh, how this work gets led and done um, in a diocese, um, you know, I know I know each setting is different, but um, there have been times when the uh, the church has been more forthright about the uh, the general requirement that every diocese uh, be engaged in this work in in some measurable ways. Um, you know. Are, are there forms of mutual accountability or uh, are there measurable things like that standards that you think uh, are helpful in general? Or is when you, in the work that you're doing in New York, uh, have you found anything different about the way it's done in New York than it's been done in Diocese of Southwestern Virginia that you think is useful for us despite the different contexts? Yeah, such a good question. I'm so glad you brought it up because one of the things that I wanted to say, um, and it's I actually, I think New York um, is figuring out uh, where it is with regard to this work, but there are other dioceses that do it um, really well are engaged in some very real ways. North Carolina is right next door um, to you guys. And, um, they have a, um, canon missioner, um, for this work. Um, I won't get the whole title right, but they have a focused, um, approach to, um, racial reconciliation that, um, is worth learning about. Um, and, and the canon missioner there, um, I don't want to offer up her time, but, um, you know, is is someone who's great to to um, get um, to speak to the guiding team and and um, help uh, fire you folks up. Um, so so there are dioceses who are doing different things. Um, the National Church is actually doing a conference for anyone involved in reparations and racial justice work at the diocese, racial reconciliation work at the diocesan level um, later this year. Um, I can't remember when it's coming up. It may be like June, July, um, but that's something that um, would be worthwhile for Diosuava to send someone to, um, to see and hear what others are doing and, and um, how um, we can help energize um, the efforts. Um, so there are there are things that are going on, um, but in terms of measurable, that's a hard one. That's a hard one, right? You've got the questions in the uh, parochial report um, that um, that talk about, but don't measure necessarily. Um, and so that that's. An interesting reference. I wonder whether it'd be valuable, for example, for the diocese, for the diocese to uh, draw those responses out from the parishes in the diocese and let us, um, in some way, you know, see uh, rather, you know, sort of. We know what our own parish is doing, but I don't think we see those responses. Students. Yeah, that, so the executive committee, um, you know, the appropriate executive committee committee um, would be perfect for that to take a look at the at the responses and and see where we are as a diocese, see where Diaswap is. It's I know hard Preston, to stop saying we. <laughs> Preston has been uh, participating in is it the weekly uh, national uh, dialogue. Uh, people involved in racial reconciliation work. Yeah, yep. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's, you know, that could be something for more of us to participate in. Yeah. Other questions or comments? All right. Well, thank you so much for being with me this evening. Patty, thank you again for the invitation. It's been a pleasure to see so many familiar faces and some new ones and get to chat about this work that is near and dear to my heart. I appreciate it. 
Marisa, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and knowledge, your faith, um, and, and walking with us. Um, it's so important to have people to walk with us on this journey. And I truly appreciate your time this evening, as well as time previously given to our diocese and to parishes. Um, it is quite a gift and we are all the better for it um, as we continue our journey of becoming beloved community. Um, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Again, next week will be our last in the session and we will walk through the justice stations of the cross. I hope you'll join us then. Good night and God bless. Good night.